So we can start. Uh, so welcome everyone to the second seminar of this quarter. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Manili Bandaru from uh, VMware. So he's going to talk about Internet of Devices deployed to a smart grid. And uh, before we start, uh, before we introduce a speaker and start the seminar, uh, there's some rules that I would like to talk about. So the, everyone will be muted uh, upon entry uh, to reduce background noise. And there are three features that you can use uh, during the presentation. The first one is this chat feature. Uh, so if you have any technical difficulties, you can use this to communicate with us. So, so in the past, we have people not uh, able to 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 hear to hear the the speaker or uh, see the the slide. So you can use this feature. And the second feature will be this raise hand. If you have any, if you need any quick clarification, uh, you can use this. For example, if there is a definition you would like the speaker to uh, clarify, you can use this. And there is this, the third feature is this Q&A feature. So if you have any in-depth questions, you should uh, type your questions uh, in, in the Q&A Q section. They will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Uh, I also want to remind you, uh, this is a, the schedule for this quarter. I would like to remind you that our next seminar is next week, next Thursday. And the speaker is Burak, uh, Burak Ospi Nisi from Oak Ridge National Lab. And he'll be talking about charging of electric vehicles. Should be an interesting one. So uh, I'll let Professor Ram Rajagopal introduce our speaker. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, Smart Grid seminar. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Malini Bandaru. She leads the open source IoT and edge efforts at, at VMware. Um, she has had a long career. She has her PhD in uh, AI and machine learning and has worked uh, in companies such as Intel, Verizon, uh, Nuance, uh, on a range of things from uh, autonomous vehicles to open source cloud software and uh, um, also a lot of uh, the power management uh, for processors and, and performance management for that. Um, besides her uh, work at VMware, she has been engaging with Stanford uh, in a collaboration around IoT that has been super exciting. So I'm very happy to, to have her here presenting today and I'm eager to, to listen to her talk. Thank you so much, Malini. Malini, you can share your slide. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Now we get to my slides. There we go desktop too. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Awesome. So thank you so much everyone for having me here today. I'm super excited Malini, to be uh, here. Sorry, before you start, uh, the bar from your Mac is appearing. Okay, how do we get rid of that guy? Uh, hide? Yeah. Did it go? Did no. the bar go yet? Not for me. Let's flip it then. One sec. Swap this place. Can you see my... Oh, wait. You're seeing the speaker view then. Hang on. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties. Swap, use slideshow. Perfect. Everything good now? Yep. Okay, cool. So thank you everyone for having me here today. I'm super excited to be here. Wish I could have seen you in person. And before we get started, I just want to tell you who all our collaborators are on this project. We have Diana and Svetomir from our Bulgaria team, Pranay from here in the US and Nicola also too from here, the US Palo Alto office. We've also worked with uh, folks from Kemu Energy, James and Cody and Armando. And we're working with some students from the University of San Francisco. They have a capstone project and we're working with them on that. 
So with that, we don't need this. Ram has already introduced me. So just a few words about VMware. Uh, it is a company that believes in sustainability and being a force for good. It's joined uh, an effort to plant many trees to reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's also working towards um, having a microgrid and that's why we are talking to you today. And the picture at the very bottom here shows you two buildings, uh, in particular one over here that has solar panels on the top and there's another one. We have some EV charge stations and that's how this whole uh, you know, microgrid effort has got launched. Uh, and we're also proud about our virtualization software that helps you consolidate multiple servers on a single physical server and reduce your energy footprint, take advantage of the latest, you know, processor performance improvements. And that's pretty much how I got involved in cloud and my whole cloud and open source journey. So with that, uh, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about renewals in the duck. IoT and Smart Grid, VMware Smart Grid POC, it's still a work in progress, not very much complete, and open source. I'm from the Open Source Technology Center, and so you'll have a lot of open source flavor here. So renewables are definitely on the rise, and um, you see more and more windmills, especially if you're in California, more solar panels. We are enriched and endowed with a lot of sunshine, so we want to make use of that. But those are distributed energy sources and that brings in complexities. It's weather dependent, time of day dependent, and that brings us to the duck. So you might have seen this graph before multiple times and at different days in the year. But essentially what this captures is as the sun comes up and then your solar panels connect and collect energy or your windmills are collecting wind power, when you have that energy might not be the time when you want to use it. And at the peak time in the day, at the bottom of this curve here, you don't have too much usage. So you have to do something about that. Otherwise, you know, you're still gonna depend on the grid to meet your needs later on at night as you peak and have your, you know, people coming home using their ovens and dishwashers and television sets and what have you. So, what are we really looking for? At the peak time of day, when you have all this energy that's coming in from your solar panels, you'd like to store this energy and use it at night or some other time when you need it and you don't have it coming you know, plentifully. Another thing is, is all that workload that you have at night really have to run at night? Can you shift it? So we're really looking at two pieces of this puzzle. Where all can you store? And how can you store? And then how can you shift your load? And addressing some of those will help us, you know, better use our uh, natural resources, your renewable resources. And by so doing, we can reduce the need for like nuclear power plants or at least how much they output and coal power plants, et cetera. And those are what's still driving the traditional legacy, you know, utility companies. And we can't let go of that if we want all the resiliency and availability that we have today. So how can you save energy, store energy? And that's pretty much how I got involved with Ram and Stanford. I mean, there's a lot of technology that's coming up, becoming cheaper with respect to storage. Your traditional storages, such as your hydroelectric facilities and dams, you can't have them everywhere and they're expensive and they're hard on the environment. Uh, we have improved battery technology. And something that's really coming up is, you know, vehicles. Your electric vehicles are also mobile batteries. So what about shifting load? Um, can we, you know, make people use their power hungry devices when the power is cheaper? Or can we move it from a different time of day when power is cheaper? Or can we be watching the price of power and things like that? But what's this all telling you? We can't have a human say, oh, now it's cheap, let me run my dishwasher. Or now it's cheap or it's plentiful, let me start charging my car. It's nice if all these can be automated. So this is kind of telling you that we need 
some kind of control mechanism, some kind of software to control all this. And that's already bringing you along into this IoT journey, the internet of things. So with that, what are the typical things that we have with any IoT kind of system? You want to be constantly sensing and monitoring to see what's coming in terms of power, what's coming in terms of load usage, and um, take into consideration any historical data for prediction purposes. What happened in the middle of you know, October or in the middle of summer? People were like putting on their air conditioners. And some of it is seasonal and some of it is time of day, okay? So we wanna take those predictions in. And if you can give about a 24 hour prediction to your utility company, it helps them for planning purposes. And there are all kinds of other issues but before we get to improving the whole utility system and you know reducing our carbon footprint we have to start measuring more and that's all of that is iot and it's very data intensive so you want to be processing your data to closer to the source of the data not all of it is interesting can you do some high level analytics there can you get some models out there and then share that with your utility company or your neighbors or your neighborhood and beyond so that you can do better planning and with all that some control so what's the smart grid and you know i'm sure all of you have an opinion uh, the way I look at it is that we have to still have everything that we had in the past. We want safety, reliability, it should be economical. We should meet the demands. So the supply should meet demands. And we want to be the future, which is you know less carbon. So we have less greenhouse gases and therefore we have less global warming. We want it to be flexible and everything else. Reliant is always there and resilient. It should be able to pick up itself and manage itself. So this also tells us another thing. If we're gonna have these solar panels and windmills everywhere, and not just those few you know, hydroelectric plants and nuclear coal power plants, et cetera, we're talking about distributed systems and they're mostly renewable. They'll have to be connected. We wanna monitor them, manage them, and maybe even sell some excess power. So with that, and wanting to get towards that uh, smarter grid, like any software, like any system, you need a test bed, a little environment that you can control and not cause damage and, and play around and play with your algorithms, play with your sensing. Am I sensing often enough? Am I modeling adequately? Have I got uh, good algorithms in place to say who should give power to whom or who should charge uh, which car right now or who needs how much charge for their car? So the best kind of test bed for this sort of process is a microgrid. And that's pretty much why VMware decided to be part of this whole effort into the smart grid and build its own little microgrid, okay? And this really comes top down from our company. Uh, our CEO, Pat Jelsinger, really believes in sustainability and the office of the CTO is very involved and invested in sustainability. So where are we? And with respect to this proof of concept. So what we really want to have in place is uh, something that monitors and manages our electric vehicle chargers. Uh, we have about uh, 178 charge ports. Um, five of those stations, and that's about 10 ports, are the ones that we have paid extra, uh, you know, API manageability support. So through those 10, we can do things like who's charging right now? How can I curb them? How can I uncurb them and things like that? Then something very dear to VMware's heart is our data centers. You know, that's our bread butter. That's how we got into this whole cloud business through our virtualization software. And then uh, you know, anybody who has a physical office might want to control that. I mean, what's the temperature you've set for the heating? Can I drop it by one degree uh, up or down or whatever? It's, if you're running an air conditioner, you can save a lot of power by just tolerating one extra degree of heat or warmth and things like that. So those are the three main things over here. And then we have two buildings with photovoltaic cells on top. They have, you know, 125 kilowatt uh, capacity. We have also two batteries on campus, one megawatt, uh, megawatt hour. 
And what we're looking is making this an island and being able to control this island and if necessary, disconnect from the grid in case of some brownout or blackout like our recent fire scenarios, maybe even contribute power back to the grid or to the city of Palo Alto or maybe with Stanford and our campus help the city of Palo Alto or other surroundings. So it's really, really early. I have nothing much to show here except some comments. Um, so the first comment is, are we looking at the right things? I mean, we mentioned electric vehicle chargers, we mentioned the data center, we mentioned the buildings. So let's see if we're even focusing at the right thing in our microgrid. And the answer is, I think so. Why? Because even though with COVID right now, you know, not people, not many people are buying cars and not many people are driving around. So we did have a dip in car sales. We did have a dip in EV sales too, but it's anticipated that over the next 30 years, this is only rising. In fact, in 20 years, we're expecting about 60% of all car sales to be electric vehicles. And if an electric vehicle, such as the Tesla that you see here, has a 75 kilowatt hour capacity, that's a pretty significant battery. And a few of these, even in the city of Palo Alto and you know, in the surroundings, that's a lot of cars. So that really adds up. And what about data centers? Are we looking at a significant problem here? Yes. Why? Because even, at, and this was a talk that we had at the Stanford campus some many months back, maybe nine months, seven, eight months back, uh, a Google, person came along and said, hey, back in 2015, we used to use 5.8 terawatts globally in our data centers. 2018, this had already nearly doubled. And who knows what is in 2020. And if you look at something like China, they are using across their country so much power that their data centers are using the capacity generated by their Three Gorges Dam. And that's the largest hydroelectric project across the world and they're using that much power already. And what about buildings? You know, we have global warming and people are getting wealthier and technology is becoming more affordable. So with time, in just about another 20, 30 years, it's anticipated that the number of air conditioning units themselves is going to go from 1.6 to 5.6 billion units. It's going to contribute about 12.7% of all total energy usage across the globe. So we, do, we are looking at the right problems. So now that I've told you, yes, we have a microgrid POC in our mind, let's look at where we are with respect to that implementation and what we're doing in open source with respect to that. So this is the year of COVID-19. It, it kind of always makes me nervous to say COVID-19 because who knows what's coming up next at 20 or 21. Um, but yes, we are here in COVID times. And we were pretty thrilled that we figured out, hey, we need to spend a little more money to get the management API for our charge EV charge stations. Uh, we have a vendor called ChargePoint and we had to pay about $200 per station. So, you know, we did that. And what does that management API provide us? It gives us the load at a group of stations, at an individual station, at the level of a single port on a station. We can make as many calls as we want to this API. We can shed load and the shed load can be a percentage, say it's you know like I'm using 100, I can shed it by 10% or I can even shed to an absolute max. You know, I need you to be within 27 units of power or whatever. And when you're kind of done with your, you know, power crunch, you can say, hey, clear all those settings, free for all, go ahead, charge. So how were things before COVID struck? Our charge stations were always fully occupied. VMware gives one and a half hours of free charge. So, you know, anybody who had an EV would come in and charge. And if they didn't uh, get off the system, they would be actually billed for the extra time. So the typical vehicle would charge between one and a half hours to about five hours. And why is this important for us? It tells us 
how much distance maybe our drivers are driving. I mean, our employees are coming from far or near or whatever, or they're just stopping off saying, hey, you know, it's free. I come into the office. Let me just kind of fill up my belly type of thing. And what else did we see in this scenario here, this little data that I shared with, you know, all the IDs and all kind of like uh, obfuscated. Um, you can tell when a car is getting, getting full, when it's at its maximum charging level, and then when it's dropping, you'll see a dip like this, you know, from 5.8, it'll drop to three something, and then finally it'll go down to zero, and that's called its trickle charging. So data like this, even if the driver is not sharing with us where they live, how much they typically drive in a week, you can tell when a car is getting full, and over time you can build some kind of uh, analytics and historical data saying, you know, if it's somebody like Malni, she typically drives only maybe 22 miles a day. I mean, I live about 11 miles away from the campus. That can tell me in situations such as a crunch, hey, if I give Malni, you know, enough charge to go home, she's going to be pretty happy. And, and then that way I can satisfy my whole employee base under some limited conditions type of stuff. Or that if I want to see if we have a crunch and I need to run the air conditioners. Maybe Malni can sell me power from her car. I don't have an electric vehicle just yet, but maybe I could sell back to the grid or back to our campus and be self-reliant over there under you know, a power crunch type of thing, as long as I have enough charge left to go home type of stuff. So these are the sort of things we wanted to get to. But what happened? March 16th came and we all had to go home and our EV charging facilities are pretty much idle. So that brings us to Project Kinney. So when we first got that API in place, uh, you know, we just did curl commands, could get the API and the values from, you know, a SOAP call. Um, it was good, we could do it. Then next thing you want to do is do it programmatically. And remember, still COVID hasn't happened. So we have all these visions of our microgrid and doing it. So we started building out a Python library, you know, basically a client to this ChargePoint API SOAP server, five server, and we could control the vehicles. But with COVID, we decided the next thing we need to do. And also we, we had been told, you know, please don't muck with the cars too much. In maybe five, 10 minutes, you can turn the power off and, you know, nobody's going to miss it too much and all. We said we need a simulator because nothing's happening. And what do we do in the simulator? It's a Go simulator. It meets the same SOAP API as the ChargePoint API. But we now can let you say, hey, you know, I want five stations versus 10 stations versus 50 stations. So you can kind of mimic different, you know, installments, whether it's an office or a mall or, or something. And also we can say what the location is. So you can then kind of mimic different vehicle behavior. Like if it's an office, the connection might be like, if it's 1.5 hours of free, you know, we can kind of put all that in our model. Or we can say it's a home, so the timing is from 6 to 8 a.m. in the morning, 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. This vehicle will be there, but it doesn't mean you have to charge it instantly, especially when there's peak power. And if this is a standard behavior, you can say when it comes and connects and disconnects, and we put some randomization over there, like somebody goes home early, somebody comes or whatever, leaves early, comes late type of stuff. So uh, we decided being the open source team that let's do this in the open. And the vision we have for Kinney, this is a project and this work we did with Kemu Energy, a startup, uh, also local to the area, that we support the ChargePoint API, but our vision is, hey, there are other EV vehicle providers, Tesla, then Nissan, and then you know maybe the one in Stanford. If we can put all these APIs and have an abstraction layer, then it doesn't matter for us you know, who's the provider. We know how to talk to it at the uniform interface, and we thought that would add value to the community. But right now, we only support ChargePoint. We haven't got all the other people involved and interested because COVID happened too. And what else can we say about this? Kemu Energy has since got a customer and they were very happy to use the software. They demoed it. And you know, I think it's going to be useful in a commercial environment now because of that. Um, what else? 
uh, our team, you know, I mentioned earlier, Diana and Svetomir and myself, we have been involved with an edge IoT framework called EdgeX Foundry. And the essence of this project is it provides you southbound connectivity across multiple protocols like Zigbee, Bluetooth, LoRaWAN, etc. So right now this charge point one just needed, you know, IP connectivity. It was making rest calls no big deal. But down the road, if we have different kinds of devices, like as we're looking at, you know, buildings and and wind turbines and whatever, this sort of system would be valuable to be able to communicate with different kinds of end devices. Uh, this project's about four years old. Uh, we have made contributions to it on the security front. I was in fact uh, the security work group co-chair for a year. Um, it has enough security built in to like check who's trying to come in. So there's a proxy server with some secure firewall over there. Uh, we have some best practices in place for like cloud native uh, development. So your containers will not be root containers and things like that. It has a rules engine so you can collect data, do some local analytics. And if you need to send up an alarm to a higher level monitoring station, you can. So those are the benefits of EdgeX Foundry and it was therefore one of our obvious choices to use this in our microgrid project. And I provided some details here. So it's open source, Apache 2 license, um, hardware agnostic, operating system agnostic. So please feel free to try if you have any questions, anything or would like to contribute. So that's one place we have invested in. So then the vision that we had of that earlier picture brought down to using EdgeX Foundry for this connectivity and for this local analytics and you know making some decisions and control. This is how we view it. We might have you know some input coming from a weather sensor, a data center because that's a power consumer too, our EV charge facility, maybe some grid input saying, hey, I'm overloaded right now, solar panels and batteries. And it doesn't have to be one edge node that takes everything from campus. If you have a lot of them, you can have a hierarchy of these. And then maybe across the town, you can have multiple of these sort of things, one per campus, one for hospital, one for whatever, and then have a town level you know, processing and control. So this is our vision. And um, EdgeX does only the local piece. But what else would you need for a real IoT application? You need to know that all your edge nodes are functioning. So you want to monitor and manage those edge nodes. You want to push you know, application software updates, security patches, et cetera. So essentially any such IoT application will have two components, a domain component. And you know, this is common to all IoT applications of monitoring and management application. There is an open source version for this too, for the monitoring management, and it's called Open Horizon. We haven't yet worked much on it, but once we get our local piece done, that would be something we'll look at next. Okay, and now let's just talk briefly about the data center. We said it has a big energy footprint, and how can we do something there? So are all your jobs super important? Do they have to run absolutely now when you have a blackout or brownout scenario? Obviously not. Just like you don't have to charge your car fully if you can get home in an emerging scenario, that's plenty. So one of the things that VMware has been doing for a while is that we've been working on virtual machines and we have the ability to see which virtual machine is not uh, you know, overloaded or it's idling. And if a bunch of the virtual machines on a host are idling, we have the ability through software called DPM, Distributed Power Management, and then another piece of software called vMotion, where we can move these virtual machines off a host if there's only one or two there instead of like the hundred or whatever you expect, to then move them off to another host and then turn this machine off. And why is it important to be able to turn off a machine? Because the power used by a server, it doesn't really you know, go linearly with its uh, you know, level of busyness or how idle it is. It's more like a, you know, exponential. So it like ramps up very quickly to about 80%. So you really want to like knock off the workloads on it and then power it off. So there is such ability, but now, Let's look at the jobs that are being submitted to your data center or cloud. So we need to know like, is this job essential 
or is it a best effort job or is it a bad job you're just running some reports or if it is your website maybe instead of having across a load balancer 100 such instances maybe one or two is okay cripple the service a little but you know it's okay under these sort of conditions so what we're working with our uh, usf students pranay and myself is in a kubernetes i mean that's the modern king of the you know orchestration cloud native kind of uh, orchestrator and that's why we chose it and working with it is let's look at the jobs that are being submitted uh, be able to see what kind of job it is so we might have to change the api and stuff like that to permit us to provide this additional insight and then under some power constraints take some remedial actions like dropping duplicates migrating workloads from one data center to the other and then finally being able to turn off machines so this is still work in progress and um, in a month or two we should have something nice to demo the students have uh, their first demo on monday so it's it's made a lot of progress uh, what else in this microgrid? And as I mentioned, and I'm being very honest, it's still a work in progress. We do have our solar panels in place. We have our batteries in place, but we are still looking for some other pieces. We have some contract that is evolving with PICE to transmit battery data to something called an IBIS system. So I still don't have enough of that in place. Uh, and I don't know how to work with it. That will become online, I think, uh, mid-December. Uh, we have the building load data already available and something funny is after COVID too, the consumption hasn't dropped much. So it definitely shows you it's not a smart building. Uh, we have people from uh, Vanderbilt University who have analyzed that data and put in some machine learning models using uh, long and short term memory for um, machine modeling over there to see how to adapt that machine load. They'll be publishing a paper but it's not been integrated into the VMware microgrid. Not yet, at least. So what are we thinking in terms of future work? Um, very near term, we want to be developing some analytics with this you know, simulated data saying, you know, who drives how much and how long are they connected and why is how long they're connected matters. Sometimes if you have everybody in the neighborhood having electric cars and they all want to charge at the same time, you can overload the system. But if you know they're going to be connected for eight hours, you could say, hey, I'll you know, finish neighbor one, neighbor two, neighbor three, and then it'll be Malini's turn. Or we can all of us be given a lower level charge rate and slowly charge over the night. So there are different options. And so things like connection time and then uh, length of the connection, how long it stays connected, and then typical drive distance. These will all be useful for developing some smart algorithms. We want to extend the device discovery piece in EdgeX Foundry. And why is that important? Maybe you don't want a hand code like, hey, you know, the VMware campus has, you know, 150 stations and so many ports and blah, 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 blah. Um, the moment you say get load, all that information is coming through that API call. We can populate it and create structures like that. So we need to do a little more extension on the EdgeX Foundry front for that. And I think it will be useful for more people than us. Uh, we also want to start adopting, uh, you know, the data center workload to a power signal. So if we say, hey, you know, curb yourself 10% or curb yourself to a certain limit, we want to say, are we in that budget? If we are in the budget, nothing to do. But if we're not, then start dropping workloads and try and fit ourselves into that budget. So those are our near-term interests. Our mid-range, you know, future work that we're looking at is connecting this to those other things that I had mentioned, like the VMware DPM and its extensions. And we want to get this microgrid pretty much in place and working and functional. So as our in collaboration with Stanford progresses and we're looking at something called trusted dare, that means we have distributed energy sources and we want to trust it. We want to be able to look at our batteries as one logical single entity, not Malni's battery versus somebody else's Ram's battery, et cetera. And maybe a little charge, more charge, but a central point from which you can get it. So it's more reliable, resilient, just like, you know, virtual uh, disk storage. Okay. So our microgrid, we hope will be a useful, valuable tool for 
you know, this testing for all the stuff that we'd be doing with Stanford. And uh, further out, you know, as EV and COVID and all start, you know, becoming more controlled things like EV picks up, COVID goes away, or at least is more controlled, we would like to have this in open source, a you know layer of abstraction so that you can work with vehicles from different vendors and you know still be sensible and manage things. Uh, further down, as you know, these distributed energy sources become more viable and more plentiful, and then there's enough that you know you have a tangible presence towards the grid, and the grid can say, hey, you know, I can maybe reduce one. Uh, utility company that does some coal firing plants, uh, then we can have some sale and use things like blockchain. And even in this space, VMware is becoming very energy conscious. And why? Because with all this blockchain, there used to be a piece that was energy inefficient to determine, you know, can I attach this chain? So we have a more energy efficient chaining process and we'd like to leverage that. So that's pretty much our ideas on future work. We'd love to see more use of these open source projects. We'd love to see contributions. And so I just put these two projects. You have you know, my email, can connect you to our team. So if there's any interest, please come and talk to us. And thank you. Hi, Malini. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so now uh, we will open for Q and A. Um, I'll start by just uh, reading off a few questions that were submitted on the Q and A, um, and uh, uh, get things going here. So th the very first question it says here, anonymous attendee. Um, does Project Kini support simulation of EV charging and discharging under different varying campus topologies? So the campus topology didn't matter for us. The API lets us get to the, the whole collection. So you can say a station group. So if you did want something like topology related, you could say, hey, all the charge stations on Hilltop G. I mean, VMware has a few sites, like the top of the hill has a few centers, something at the bottom near the creek has some. So you could do things like that to capture the notion of topology. But once you have a group, you can get the load and you can curtail the load to that station group or even to an individual port. Does that answer your question? Um, it, yeah, I don't know the, how to check that here. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, okay. Um, yeah, since there was no follow-up question, I think it does answer the questioner's question. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, there were three questions submitted by Solmaz, Nazar Ali Zadeh. Um, she is asking about first uh, time delays in communications how is that taken into account in IoT? And how is the uh, processing time or processor time uh, considered as well in your platform? Very, very good question. And IoT is about you know, latency. You want to uh, be close to the data source, be close to those sensors and actuators so you can you know, analyze your data and respond in a timely manner. That said, Solmas, very important to think about what your actual application is. Even when you talk real time, what is that latency you're really interested in? Is it sub millisecond? Is it seconds? Is it hours, et cetera? So with these EV charge facilities, if I give a signal saying curb or, or uncurb or whatever, the clear shed, it takes about um, 30 seconds or more to get a response from the system. And that's not bad. So uh, if you say a minute kind of latency, it's still great in our scenario. But if it was some other kind of application, such as an industrial application where you're revetting something or soldering something and, or even some AR, VR kind of thing, then you're gonna look for millisecond kind of response latencies. So that also dictates where you put this uh, facility and things like that. And an important thing in this EV charging thing is, I'm not really talking to that EV charge point and the power line over there. I'm really talking to their API service. So there's several layers of, uh, 
you know, in direction over there because the charge point charge API station server is getting its data and then I'm getting it from that entity. And, you know, if we really need to go closer, we would have to go to the actual physical device and, and have another source of control over there. So then there was a, I will summarize the other two questions. Um, she's wondering about uh, how can IoT aid in the stability of the grid in terms of the voltage, frequency, and even the assessment of stability? Mm. And this is an area I don't know much about. I'm hoping to learn way more from Ram and Abbas and all about battery voltage phase, et cetera. I'm just picking up right now. But one of the things that we see over here is um, you maybe need real time uh, operating systems control at a much finer granularity than my one millisecond type of thing. But again, this is an area I have to learn more about. Are we looking at sub sub minute kind of uh, stability type of stuff. And it'll become problem based in how we attack the problem. Then. Okay, very good. Um, the next question is from Emmanuel Balogun. Um, he's curious about the efficient blockchain methodology that VMware will be using. Can you expound on this? Absolutely, Emmanuel. Um, Please search on, I mean, like in your Google browser, go ahead and say VMware and Project Conquer blockchain. We have a whole bunch of blogs, um, blogs uh, um, and um, that's the Project Conquered. Uh, you can understand how it uh, works and then, you know, explore if you want to use it, talk to the engineers. And that's one thing about open source. You can think of us as friendly people. You can think of us as lonely people. You can think of us as eager people who want to share. So those engineers on the Slack channel, on their email would be more than happy to, you know, talk to you, help you use it, would love you to work with it, leverage it, et cetera. And one of the ways that you reduce your power consumption in these sort of blockchain systems is it's a sense of trust. Like you let in folks that you believe and trust and therefore the amount of work you have to do to check that you know, they're doing the right thing or honest or whatever can be reduced. So the larger your net is and the more unknown people you have, it's harder to trust. So you have more stringent uh, checks and proof of work type of things. But in smaller communities where you trust the entities, your proof of work therefore reduces, so your compute cycles reduce, so you're more power efficient. And that's the, the philosophy behind these systems. Okay, very good. Um, so Alan Chow has a question. If we want to implement what has been learned from a microgrid setting, to a larger scale power grid setting, um, what do you see that needs to be changed for the large scale power grid? So Alan, um, think about it as a hierarchical system. Whatever you do in your little microgrid, think of it as a local thing. And then let's say just in the city of Palo Alto, you say you have your Palo Alto VMware campus, then maybe the, uh, the Veterans Hospital is one campus, Stanford campus. So you have to basically work in a distributed fashion and, and have a hierarchical chain of command. And if you're trying to get a signal from the grid, the frequency at which you get that, and then you have to play games, like maybe the hospital and its needs are more important. So if there is a crunch at that level, so a device at the lowest leaf level might be your EV charger, might be your building. But at the next higher level, the device is really a composite. It's the VMware campus at the, and the Stanford campus. And then you then have ideas of minimum and maximum. So let's say now we're talking Stanford campus in a crunch, we'll say the minimum power is maybe for the hospital. And then the maximum is the whole campus and all the offices and the buildings and the whatever, whatever. So we'd have to have a notion of these composites or loads in terms of minimum requirement, maximum requirement, importance, no different from the way we're thinking about those workloads in the data center. So then it'll allow us to reason and then say, hey, you know, in this crunch, how am I distributing power to these different sub entities? 
And that's how you get to scale by not getting into like at the top level, being able to control all the little devices across your whole city as, you know, top down immediately. So you, you scale by fanning out like this through a hierarchy. Very, very good. Thank you, uh, Malini. Um, there, Wait, there was that Vanderbilt question. So uh, Vanderbilt also has a DOE grant. They're working on a system called RIAPS. And, um, you know, I can find you that information and send if you send Ram email and then we can get back in touch with you. But they analyzed the building uh, historical data. It wasn't live because all that IBIS and Johnson control and all is not yet in place, but we had the historical data monthly, yearly, et cetera. Is IoT working with model-free approach? We receive just data, we know. Ah, so IoT, um, you can define your models in uh, EdgeX. We have something called a device profile. Uh, so you can have one for a light bulb and then uh, the profile is light bulb, but you can have multiple instances of it, which might just differ in terms like, is it on, is it off? It's location. So it's free uh, format. You can define these profiles. And then once you have a profile defined, you can discover it from the data it sends and says, hey, you know, I'm a light bulb and then you know how to treat it. Uh, we can have a composite device such as this uh, EV charge facility. You don't need to model it at each port, etc. You can say, hey, EV charger, I want you to do something smart. I have a power budget. See which car you'll feed or which one you won't. And you can have levels of hiddenness if you want, or you can go right down to each port on this uh, charge facility. Um, Eric has a question about uh, smart grid technology standards and regulation. Uh, are they being established? Um, and what are the bodies and regulatory agencies? But I Very good question. Yeah, yeah. Please, if, please. So um, Eric's question, like Ram was saying, you know, what's happening in the land of standards and regulation and standards bodies. So one of the things is standards bodies are good, but it, it can be slow. And in today's uh, software environment, uh, code comes first. And then if it works and you modify it, and then if it doesn't work and iterate and blah, blah, blah. And once it kind of feels like it's the right thing, code then becomes the standard. And in that context, uh, there is something called the Linux Foundation. And under that uh, umbrella, it's like a free thing. And, you know, it's a body and companies pay money to it. And they say, hey, you know, I don't own it. We all own it. And that's the whole open source ethos. And there are other foundations too like that. Uh, they have under their umbrella LF Energy. And they're trying to develop standards, but it's not yet there in the smart grid world. There are a few utility companies. So it's really our space if we want to start putting things in. And that was why I even thought of this project, Kini. And I didn't even put it under the VMware a company umbrella. I said, let's put it in Kemo Energy umbrella because at least it's an energy company and it's not our core business, though we're interested in it from a sustainability. So you know, we can bring the kinies of the world projects like that into LF Energy. We can contribute to that, you know, umbrella. Um, and, uh, you know, as more and more people start adopting and feeling the need for it, we'll have code through open source and then that can eventually become standards so lf energy is definitely one of them and the iot stuff there is uh, the eclipse foundation there's the linux foundation and the linux foundations for lf uh, edge because we know that you can't just have your iot devices connect to a cloud it comes back to another question that we had earlier what's the latency in getting these signals right so you start doing more edge processing closer to the data source. Okay. Um, I don't see any additional questions here. So maybe I will ask a couple of questions, Malini. Um, Go ahead. Can, can you comment a little bit uh, about um, what are the challenges you see for IoT in terms of security when you're dealing with grid applications? Uh, very good question. Uh, we definitely want our grid reliable. We don't want people hacking into it. So one of the things is 
with IoT, security is a bigger deal because it's not like you have it in a data center with with guards over there, with multiple doors, with multiple locks. And if anybody's been to a data center, one interesting point I had heard is when you go in your weight, when you're coming out your weight, so if you were to take even a little USB stick drive and introduce a bug or leave it behind, it would get captured, okay? So we don't have so many things in place. So one of the things that is possible is using some hardware-based security um, solution on that device, whether it's your Raspberry Pi or your Intel Nook or a server. These things are called uh, TPMs, Trusted Platform Modules. There's another alternative solution from ARM. So there's an open source project called Parsec that's abstracting this layer of implementation, whether you're using uh, a trusted platform module from Infineon or on your Intel chip or your AMD chip, or you're using ARM solution. Uh, so that layer is abstracted. So you can say, hey, you know, please encrypt what I'm going to put. So that if this disk gets stolen, no loss, nobody can see it. And uh, you can encrypt that. And a part of this hardware security model is like you want identity, you want reliable identity. Like if I get a message from Ram saying, hey, you know, the seminar is canceled today and I don't show up, it could be very damaging. It's like a denial of service. So how do I be sure it's Ram? So one thing with these trusted platform modules and their ilk is that there's three components to it. One is an ID that can only be set by the manufacturer. So we're talking Intel that or, or Infineon, they set that ID. Second level ID comes from the OEM, the person who put all this together and sold you the box could be Dell, okay? A third level is when you take ownership of it, then you set a key, okay? So let's say today I owned it and tomorrow I gave it to Ram, then he owns it, he resets everything. So at that point, you have three keys that are unique to this device. And if that's the device you know or expect, and when I sent it out from the factory and said, hey, you know, I'm going to put this in Starbucks or I'm going to put it in my electric grid somewhere, I have that ID at that point, you know, the manufacturer, the OEM, and then the owner in this case, Ram. So I have proof of the ID, a known ID. And then from that point on, no private keys leave this hardware security model. It's all encrypted and you have to really break it in, you know, by that time the device is useless. So that's how you can save configuration information, keys, passwords, et cetera, and, you know, have legitimate ID. And then once you have that ID and these keys, you can do encrypted communication. So that's possible. And another very important thing um, in addition to security is uh, reliability. You don't want your edge node to be a singleton. Uh, you should think about at least two nodes over there. So in case one falls apart, the other one's alive and working before you can roll out a truck. So your battery is still online, that house still gets power, or the hospital still gets power. So one of the things we're thinking is, you know, even though EdgeX Foundry was like, hey, I can all live on this collection of microservices can all run on a single node. That node dies, we're in deep water. So we think of these things as edge clouds so that you can have resiliency and high availability and things like that. It's also good for software update, coming back to your security thing. Let's say you see a new vulnerability like heart bleed or I love you virus or whatever. Uh, you can update one node and then that point, put that in maintenance mode and the other one's still running. When this gets updated, move your workloads. Remember how we had said we can do V motion for virtual machines, same way containers can launch on another machine. And that's how you have security, reliability, et cetera. Um, thank you. Uh, there is time for maybe uh, one more question. So uh, this one is from Anurag Sivastava. Uh, how IoT provides multiple services, stability, res reliability, resiliency for extreme scenarios at a large scale system? So um, you don't even need to think large scale. You need at least two for minimal, you know, one node goes down, another one is there. If you have three, it's even better. How does it give you uh, reliability? Uh, when you're talking things like cloud applications or virtual machine type of applications, 
If you looked at the um, project called Kubernetes, a cloud orchestrate of containers, there is a process over there. Again, everything for reliability will not be one service. There'll be three of them and there's leader election. These are standard software practices at this point. So it watches all the processes that are running, say, oops, this one died. It relaunches that same one. So that's how you get resiliency and reliability by monitoring processes that watch for these things and say, hey, it's like a watchdog process. Then uh, coming back to your question, uh, it gave you that it's stability because once this is there, it's there, it's running. And then if you have more load, you can launch another instance of it. So you can do some kind of load balancing. So these are all the sort of supports that we have nowadays in these modern cloud applications. Great. Um, and uh, maybe as a, another question here, uh, Emmanuel is asking, how are you protecting the microgrid from cyber attacks? How information is masked? Any redundancies considered? So the redundancies I mentioned with like multiple nodes, cyber attack is not just IoT specific. I mean, you can have a cyber attack on your servers in your data center. So the best practices there you will also use in your microgrid. So everything that you're doing in your data center, you can do it at in your IoT device. It's always the point is the money. How much are you going to do? How much are you going to invest in it? Let's say you're transmitting like a telco cloud. That's also an edge kind of application. Then you're going to put some beefy processing power at that edge, like a, you know, a Xeon server type of stuff. They can even have something called QAT, quick assist technology. So it can do very fast crypto. So it depends which kind of uh, demands you put on it. But otherwise the technology for encryption and all is pretty standard. Things like denial of service and checking for that is pretty standard. And then if it's a very high value device, you can even have other, you know, machine learning models over there watching for anomalies. You can have other stuff there watching for what packets are coming and do deep packet inspection. So that body of literature and that body of technologies is is well known and available and it's just the price point. If it's a high value IoT edge, like a utility edge, you'll do it. But if it's just your home's uh, panels, it depends how much are you willing to spend? It's like $100, uh, about $70 is a Raspberry Pi and it might be enough. One battery going offline is maybe not the worst thing, but then, hey, if it's your home office, you need it online, you need it to work, you'll be maybe ready to spend $1,000. So I think it'll be a matter of uh, configuring based on your needs. Oh yes, and absolutely available to contact me. Um, you can you know, search for Malini Bandara on LinkedIn and connect with me there and just say, hey, you know, Stanford uh, Bits and Watts and we can yeah. get in and touch. And Malini, your slides will be available right through Canvas. Oh, perfect, yeah, and my and email is I, there. I think your email contact will be there as well. So I think uh, that's another mechanism to, to reach out. Awesome. Uh, Okay, I think there are no more questions. And, uh, and I had wonderful questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Malini. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, participating in the webinar today.